Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a second for everybody to come into the group. Welcome, welcome all. Hi, and everybody. Welcome. Morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> We're so excited to have you all join us today. And officially, welcome to Within's Continuing Education, our webinar series. My name is Ashley Barkoviak, and I'm the Clinical Operations Coordinator here at Within Health. Today, I would like to introduce you to our two presenters, Carrie Ann Doriano and Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt. Carrie Ann is one of our primary therapists here at Within. She is a licensed professional counselor who has worked in the mental health field for the past 10 years. She is certified in intuitive eating and Carrie Ann practices from health at every size perspective and is passionate about dismantling diet culture and weight-based stigma. Carrie Ann is also DBT and CPT informed. And Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt is a world leading expert on treating eating disorders. With more than 25 years of clinical experience, she has developed five distinctive treatment programs, all grounded on strong bio psychosocial foundation and incorporating intensive psychotherapy with behavioral foundations and high medical standards. Wendy has developed a unique treatment approach that devolves into underlying issues that place a person at risk for mental health conditions and eating disorders and leading to healing health and inner peace. And she is our wonderful CEO officer at Within Health. I will now pass things over to Jamie Singletary, who will go over how to get the CE credits. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. My name is Jamie Singletary, and I am the Director of Clinical Brand Development for Within Health, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all today. Just want to go over a few housekeeping items as it pertains to obtaining your credits. We are offering both a CE and CME credit. For those of you that are just obtaining the CE credit today, all of that information will be available to you in your CEGO dashboard. You will have a link to complete an evaluation at the close of the presentation that will then give you the opportunity to download your CE certificate. In the event you have to change devices or you have technology issues, we will see to it that you are still given credit. Ashley and I will both place our contact information in the chat should you have any additional questions. If you are looking to obtain a CME credit, please chat me directly and email me your email address so that I can send you over those directions as well. Before we get started, I also want to mention that Within Health, as you all may or may not know, is an intentional remote eating disorder program that treats individuals from adolescents all the way up through older adult for those that are struggling with an eating disorder, offering the PHP and IOP levels of care. We are a full interdisciplinary team and we offer several specialty groups as well as therapy groups. I do encourage you if you want more information to visit our website withinhealth.com or you can email me to obtain additional information one last thing I want to mention, our wonderful Director of Clinical Research, Dr. Caitlin Shepard, is leading our first clinical outcome report, which will be available in about two weeks or so. So please be on the lookout for that as well. And if you go to your CEGO dashboard, we do have materials that we have attached so that you can have some takeaways from our presentation today. And I'll give it back to you, Ashley. Wonderful. Just as a note too for all of our attendees, we will not be providing the slides today. A video will be recorded and that'll be available on your CEGO dashboard. You will not get credit for just watching the video. You do have to attend live today. But again, if you want access to either the handouts or that video after the presentation, that'll all be through your CEGO dashboard. If there are any additional questions, concerns regarding the CE credits or any other issues that evolve, please feel free again to either myself, either email myself or Jamie. I will also provide CEGO's contact information in the chat as well. We also want to utilize the chat for any questions that do arise, so please feel free to put those questions in the chat. We will save some time for that. I also want to share that we have an exciting presentation on July 26th by our own Ronnie Lee. He will be presenting on considerations for psychological testing in a virtual setting, and that'll be at 11 a.m. Eastern time. You can see our social media sites to register for that. And I also want to mention that our Within Summit is in the works and is being planned for October 8th through the 11th. And that'll be reflections of wellness, healing from within, and celebrating body inclusivity. So please make sure to check out our social media sites for that. And now I would love to hand things over to Carrie Ann and Dr. Wendy. 
Thanks very much, mm -hmm. Ashley. Thank you, Jamie and Ashley. So welcome everyone. Today, we're gonna to be talking about beyond binging. So treating binge eating disorder in a virtual setting. Um, so I'm Carrie and Doriana. Thank you, Ashley, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm gonna be presenting today with Wendy. Here I am, let's <laughs> roll. <laughs> Alrighty. So our objectives for today are to explain the benefits of incorporating specialized programming for binging disorder in virtual treatment and understand ways to implement care. And we hope that you all come away from this presentation being able to understand how weight stigma and anti-fat bias plays a role in the treatment of binge eating disorder and the importance of practicing from a weight neutral approach. And we'll also help you identify different treatment interventions for binge eating disorder in the virtual setting and in general. All right, so what is binge eating disorder? Um, one definition of it comes from the DSM-5. Um, that is a, an episode of binge eating is characterized by both eating in a discrete period of time, an amount that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. And it also includes a sense of lack of control around eating. Um, and then it also has three or more of the following. So eating more rapidly than normal, eating until uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone because of being embarrassed by how much one is eating, feeling disgusted by how much one is eating, and feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed, or very guilty after overeating. Um, binge eating occurs at least two days a week for six months, or at least one day a week for three months. Um, and according to the DSM, there's also this um, diagnostic criteria, which is that binge eating is not associated with regular use of inappropriate compensatory behavior. So this diagnostic criteria we have found to be kind of controversial because for people working with clients with binge eating disorder, what we found most, if not all, engage in some form of restriction. And so the debate is, is restriction inappropriate compensatory behavior? Is it something that should be included or not be included in the DSM? So that's just something that we want to highlight and make sure people are being aware of when they're working with clients that engage in binge eating, is that they are addressing the restriction component as well. Yeah, and it's such an important thing. One of the anecdotals that I'll share is that, you know, so often when you do work with somebody with binge eating disorder, of course, there's that that way that weight stigma has been internalized and translated into shame and uh, restriction, as, as Carrie Ann mentioned. And so really probing around the restriction and engaging around the restriction is incredibly important. We feel that a focus on just the binging without a focus on the restriction is really sort of a form of gaslighting. Um, and, you know, one of the anecdotes I like to share is if you ask somebody, what did you eat right before you binged? Like what's, what happened? Like if you're doing a chain analysis, really often it'll be like, oh, I, uh, yeah, I, I ate some celery, you know, or I ate a salad, you know? And so a lot of times there's that person starts to get hungry, but they have such restriction and shame. They, push aside that restriction, which only then sets them up, up to binging. So we really do think the DSM-5 does present some um, problems, but uh, we'll keep going and we'll talk more about that as we, as we go through the talk today. Right. And so there are other eating disorders with binge eating symptoms, and we think this is important to include in this conversation because of the difficulty with the diagnosing appropriately. So some people may be diagnosed with any of these other eating disorders when their appropriate diagnosis might be binge eating disorder or even vice versa. Um, and in our programming, what we try to do is have programming that is specified for people with binge eating symptoms instead of binge eating disorder only. So to make sure that we are including everyone that would benefit from binge eating programming. Yes. And I think, you know, when you think about the difference between anorexia nervosa, atypical anorexia, binge eating disorder, and bulimia nervosa, it, it can get very, very confusing because bulimia nervosa does have as one of the compensatory behaviors, it's pro prolonged restriction. So in that case, somebody with BED who's doing the restriction, do they have BED or do they have bulimia nervosa? 
Similarly, um, a person with atypical, you know, anorexia engages for sure in the restricting. Now, there is the binge purge type. So then it becomes a little muddled there. So we find it to be really a complex situation. And I can self-disclose that when I look back at my own life and my own trajectory, my own lived experience as somebody who's been doing this for over 20 years. And I think about my own presentation when I was, you know, a teenager through early 20s. I literally could not tell you right now today, did I have atypical anorexia? Did I have bulimia? Did I have no later on? I was like, oh, I think I had binge eating disorder, but, but it was like, but wait, binge eating disorder says there's no inappropriate compensatory behavior. But we know that those with binge eating disorder are very restrictive. So some of the things that we think are a little bit subtle that you can kind of pick up on, um, instead of focusing on just the binge behavior, is really thinking about the restriction behavior and what's driving that. With bulimia nervosa, when you look further at some of the diagnostic criteria, if you want to go DSM, you see that that criteria about self-evaluation is unduly weight based on weight and shape. Um, with anorexia nervosa, you see some other things that tie into identity. You see it can be the disturbance in how the weight and shape is experienced, like the cognitive distortion. You do see that undue influence criteria on self-evaluation that crosses over with bulimia nervosa. And then, of course, with anorexia, you also see that lack of insight or lack of recognition of the seriousness of the symptoms. So I, I would say there's some subtleties there to help really figure it out as far as like if you really want to think what the diagnosis is. And I think under all of these conditions, it's important just to remember that weight stigma is driving every form of an eating disorder. And I think my take on it is that a person with binge eating disorder certainly has incredible guilt and distress and a lot of times tremendous body image um, preoccupation and anxiety. But I would say in the whole, there would be less inclination towards the person's identity be, being so caught up in the eating disorder. I think that is one area where you might see a little bit less of a grip on your actual identity. Not to say that the body image disturbance is not um, a source of great pain, but the actual identity formation may be a little different. These are gross generalizations that um, are more for discussion than to be, um, you know, mandated or saying this is the way it is. There's more, of, these are more conversations I think to have. I've had calls with our whole research team to actually try to figure out when our people get, when people get admitted, like how are we thinking about what diagnosis to give? Because technically if you exclude somebody with binge eating disorder because they're restrictive, then they could land in the atypical anorexia category when somebody else might say they have binge eating disorder. So very confusing. We'll just leave it at that. Very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> confusing. And also like we do have statistics and epidemiology of for binge eating disorder. And right. so even though the diagnostic criteria is confusing and people might be diagnosed with other eating disorders when they are more appropriate for binge eating disorder, it is still more common than bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa. So binge eating disorder occurs in one in 35 adults in the US, which translates to an estimated 3.5% of females um, around 5 million, and then 2% of males around 3 million at some point in their lifetime. Um, nearly 40% of people with binge eating disorder are men. And this month is Men's Health Awareness Month. So that's a stat that we really wanted to highlight and show as important. Um, and a lot of the talk today is going to be about how eating disorders aren't just one body type. They're not just one race. And so these stats are really important. And as we talk about weight stigma, that's going to show, show up a lot more in this presentation leading to that up to two thirds of individuals with binging disorder live in larger bodies. But what that does mean is one third of individuals with binging disorder don't live in larger bodies. So not everyone with binging disorder ha lives in a larger body and not everyone in a larger body that shows up with an eating disorder is diagnosed with binge eating disorder or is it, or has the symptoms of binge eating disorder.
Also up to 94% of those with binging disorder also meet diagnostic criteria for other psychiatric disorders. So some that we see more frequently are ADHD, trauma, and depression. Um, and just as a reminder why this is so important is because binging disorder is associated with considerable functional impairment and a poor quality of life. So it really impacts people's day-to-day -day functioning. And Wendy, I'm gonna pass it over yeah. to you. Yeah, and what's really sad about that is that so often those folks with binge eating disorder, especially if they've their body has retained weight as a result of the binge eating, are directed towards traditional weight loss. Mm -hmm. And obviously tr seeking weight loss treatment or being directed to weight loss treatment, we've actually been doing some research on this, does cause a duration of an increase in and in duration of untreated illness, or shall I say increase likelihood that you're going to go longer without actually getting treatment. And if you ever have a patient with BNG disorder, that is a red flag for the psychiatric comorbidity that Carrie Ann just mentioned. Um, we see a tremendous amount of ADHD coexisting trauma and definitely underdiagnosed, undertreated depression. Um, so these are really, you know, and that's the sad part about, um, some of the weight loss focus is is the actual like grasping the seriousness of this very significant psychiatric condition, binge eating disorder, which coexists with other very treatable psychiatric conditions. And this just really leads to so many folks being untreated. Um, the B binge eating disorder itself was just added to the DSM only in 2013. So just literally 11 years ago. And, you know, it's really refreshing um, to do this talk with Carrie Ann, I'll say, just because I'm kind of an old timer now, which kind of cracks me up because my identity is that I'm 18 years old trying to figure out what I'm doing with my life. But working with Carrie Ann is a reminder that I've been around a while. <laughs> and, you know, BED wasn't even in the, the DSM. And we called it at that time, we called it um, ED in the DSM 3R. It came in in 1987. And it was under the eating disorder, not otherwise specified, which is kind of funny because it's more common than anorexia and bulimia nervosa mm -hmm. combined, but it was the NOS, you know, and I think the fact that it took so much time and it was just so kind of throw in as NOS really shows it's really illustrative of weight stigma. And this is a condition where because the person may gain weight as a result of the eating disorder the condition is treated as less serious or it's treated as kind of a less than kind of condition um, with more shame. And this is really about, you know, weight stigma first and foremost. Interestingly enough though, um, binge eating disorder itself first was spoken about in 1959, a psychiatrist and researcher by the name of Dr. Albert Stunkard was the first person to talk about it. And he talked about three, um, kind of characteristic behaviors. He spoke about binging itself, and then he spoke about eating without satiety. So he noticed difficulty there. And then he also spoke a lot about um, night eating syndrome. So we see a lot of night eating syndrome also. Um, of course, night eating kind of ties in with what you see also with the shame about eating. So eating secretly at night, um, and then also just the dysregulation that happens from prolonged restriction as well. So those are things that we have to kind of address when somebody does have um, the night eating. And so there's some confusion too. You hear the language of compulsive overeating as another kind of way that it's sort of thrown in like, oh, it's compulsive overeating. And so then it's thought, oh, you just have to like stop being a compulsive overeater and you're just addicted and just stop doing that when in fact you've got this treatable um, condition. Um, you know, so this de delay is, can be, you know, up to 10 years post onset. Um, there's a lot, there's a real problem with public awareness about BED because it's overshadowed by the weight loss industry. Um, and also, um, some of the people that are suffering from BED don't even understand it as an actual eating disorder. They just think they're like this dysregulated shame-based, you know, human being. Um, so weight treatment programs, BED is a frequent phenomenon of up to 30%. I actually think it might be higher. Um, and there's just so much misunderstanding about, about BED and treatment professionals, um, and so much, so much misunderstanding about restriction. And when I 
really one of the things I got really concerned about in developing higher levels of care from really early on is the tremendous harm that has been done to individuals with BED if they're living in a larger body, uh, iatrogenic harm, and I would say trauma, because those folks living in larger bodies so often have been prescribed weight loss um, and exercise as a piece of their treatment and have been put on restrictive meal plans that actually only exacerbates the eating disorder. But beyond that, it is a, a deep wound to the, the soul of that human being who is hungry and in need of food, which is, you know, correlates to just do, do you even matter? You know, if you don't even matter, your needs, if your need to eat doesn't matter, like, do you even matter becomes the, the question. Um, and the answer so often has been even those who have received treatment, the answer from the treatment community has been you, you don't, you don't really matter. Your need to eat doesn't really matter because you're in this larger body. And that's just a shame and it's terrible. So that ties together with just the importance of, of understanding um, weight stigma. And we do have Weight Stigma Awareness Week also coming up in addition to the Within Summit, um, which Within always participates and supports us on so very much. Um, and we really believe that weight stigma awareness is, is really central to helping to someday eradicate eating disorders. We, we believe that the normalization and the medicalization of weight stigma has caused tremendous harm. And the number one really perpetrator of, of weight stigma very often are doctors themselves. And Christy Harrison calls it consistent systemic oppression, which makes against larger body people, which makes it difficult or impossible to find clothes, spaces that fit, healthcare that's effective and non-discriminatory, equal access to employment and other basic human rights that we all deserve. It does also involve a social devaluation and denigration of people due to carrying what is conceived of as excess weight. And it really is a form of social, socially acceptable um, discrimination. And part of what we do here, and Carrie Ann and I will talk more about it, is really teaching and educating around this. It really is a part of treatment. A big part of treatment starts with education for our folks because it does impact um, even access to care. So many folks living in a larger body just go to the doctor and have terrible, terrible, terrible traumatizing experiences. Um, and helping people start off with understanding that they deserve something different is a big piece of their their healing process. Um, first of all, I mean, or second of all, or third of all, whichever you want to call it, you know, evidence does not support that higher weight causes health issues, nor that losing weight necessarily promote health. Healthy behavior can help with health issues such as movement, appropriate movement, um, gentle self-care that shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, so weight and weight cycling has very significant health outcomes and weight, weight cycling is very rarely talked about in the media. We always hear the O word, but we very hear the general public doesn't even know what this concept even is. Weight, weight cycling. So we think there's a real need for public awareness around the negative um, impact of weight cycling. And finally, and I think this is la last but not least, there's a range of all body sizes for all eating disorders. Thank you, Wendy. So mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss now what is a weight neutral approach. So a weight neutral approach is um, a counter approach to the weight normative approach that a lot of people practice. So weight normative is prescribing weight loss, is focusing on per a person's BMI, whereas a weight neutral approach takes the focus off of weight um, and a person's body size. Instead, it focuses on improving someone's relationship with food. Um, and that can be a part of that can be to remove moral judgments around food. So getting rid of that like good, bad mentality or, and focusing more on that, like food is food and there's nourishment in it. It also focuses on building awareness of hunger and fullness cues. So one way that to do that would be to practice intuitive eating and learning those skills around be, being more um, aware of your body's cues and practicing interceptive awareness. And also emphasizes 
emotional and physical wellness over pursuit of lower weight or size. So like Wendy mentioned earlier, the well, like wellness enhancing behaviors or health promoting behaviors, and that's different for every person. Um, and it can't, it doesn't follow along with someone losing weight. It's more based on how do you enhance your life? What can we add to your um, experience? An important piece of it is also advocating for the removal of stigma experiences for persons with larger bodies. So not just working individually with people, but also at a societal level of trying to help decrease this stigma and pushing back against um, weight stigma and anti-fat bias. Um, also, like I mentioned earlier, incorporates intuitive eating and he the health at every size framework, which we're gonna go into detail in a little bit. So why is a weight neutral approach important? Um, we're just gonna keep reiterating that there's minimal evidence for successful long-term maintenance of weight loss. Um, people that go on diets or restrictive meal plans will often gain the weight back plus some. The more dangerous thing is weight cycling. So a person with a stable weight is healthier than someone that loses and gains weight over a period of time. It's also been found that programs that have a weight neutral approach have greater treatment engagement and lower dropout rates. So people are engaging in treatment longer. They're getting what they need out of these programs. Um, they're seeing things come to fruition in their recovery. Shame is a really big emotion that goes along with binge eating disorder. And so it's really important that the weight neutral approach helps decrease shame. And it also helps increase self-perception. So treating a person as a person and not a number on a scale can be really important and life-changing for people. And as we all know, like resiliency is really important for someone to develop. And that is, um, can be fostered through the weight neutral approach. So that's also really important. And so when we're talking about binge eating disorder, I also think it's important to talk about food insecurity because that is um, a systemic issue that affects over 38 million people in the US. And this was as of 2020, so I'm sure it's even higher now. So when someone has limited or no access to a variety of affordable or accessible foods, that can trigger that kind of famine response. It, it is a restriction, a type of restriction. Um, and that's not just like because of financial reasons, it, reasons, it could also be if someone lives in like lives in a food desert area where they don't have access to supermarkets or grocery stores and things like that. And as we know, lack of access to consistent food can lead to a preoccupation or obsession with food. So if someone is going a week without having groceries and then they get paid or they get their benefits and then they they might engage in binge eating because their body is going into this feast or famine cycle. And we've even seen data that people who have food insecurity compared to people who have food security, there are higher rates of binge eating of the population of people who have food insecurity. So kind of Which going back to- a little sense, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's mimicking a restrictive diet. It's mimicking- um, someone going on a meal plan that's restrictive. And it kind of also goes back to when we were talking earlier about how there is this stereotype of what an eating disorder looks like, and that is further from the truth. So especially when we're thinking about food insecurity, that disproportionately affects people of color and low income individuals and families. So when you are screening someone or meeting with someone and talking to them about it, it's really important to discuss food habits and go be like further behind just like, what did you eat today? What's going on more like long-term for people? So I'm gonna go through this a little bit briefly. So, and then we're gonna switch to how we treat binge eating disorder within health. So in the field, there are a couple assessments for binge eating disorder and eating disorders in general. Um, that assess for binge eating disorder. So there's those diagnostic interviews and questionnaires. Um, there's some self-report symptoms. And then there's also two loss of control eating scales, which if you remember the DSM-5, that's part of the diagnostic criteria is having a loss of control over eating. So these are just some assessments that are in the field. And then 
treatment modalities for binge eating disorder. Again, this is what's recognized in the field and are some things that we incorporate into our treatment at Within Health. So there's psychotherapy, there's structured self-help. Um, there's also CBT, which has shown to have um, a long-term reduction in binge eating. And they created um, CBT enhanced for eating disorder. So that is a manualized way to address binge eating um, disorder. It goes through a couple of things. First, it educates clients about binging disorder and CBT. Um, and then it helps people self-monitor methods to identify problematic eating patterns while establishing normal eating patterns. It also helps people identify and modify maladaptive thoughts regarding body image and eating. It helps teach problem solving skills um, and then helps people maintain normalized eating, consolidating skills and learning relapse prevention approaches. So this is the most used treatment of binge eating disorder. And there's also- say, We believe very much that some of these can be very, very helpful, but I just wanna say within is really, we do a lot of different things, but none of this can happen unless there's the, the vehicle for all of this is the relationship between our team and the clients that we serve, which um, I just wanted to throw throw in there. <laughs> we do not think that manualized care serves serves the patients the way they deserve. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's also interpersonal psychotherapy and DBT, which have also been found to be effective when treating clients with binge eating disorder. Um, interpersonal psychotherapy looks at binging disorder as a negative social evaluation of someone that has a detrimental effect on their self-esteem, which can trigger eating disorder symptoms. And then the eating disorder is used to help with emotion regulation. The goal of this is to help clients manage and express feelings more comfortably and effectively. And then DBT goes through the four modules of mindfulness, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness and emotion regulation. And it is shown to be helpful for clients with certain comorbidities. So depression, substance use, and suicidal ideation. So I was sort of getting ahead of myself when, when Carrie Ann was going over the CBT one, but I just couldn't help it. Sorry, <laughs> Carrie Ann. It's just that it's so important for, we want, we want folks to understand that we really believe the interpersonal and the connection between our our team and the patients is really the foundation for healing and um, the quality of the therapeutic relationship really kind of governs everything with us at Within, with, and that's across the entire multidisciplinary treatment team. Um, we believe that it's really important, a big piece of treatment at Within is really about advocacy also. So our advocacy of the patient and them, their need to take care of themselves, their deserving care um, is a big piece of it. And we believe that through our advocacy, they can internalize that and eventually become able to advocate for themselves. This is particularly important for those that live in a larger body because we're really having to do um, a paradigm shift. Now, in some cases, people don't are, are, are tired of having to fight for themselves and their needs. In that case, we wouldn't, we wouldn't sort of prescribe, okay, become an advocate or fight for fight diet culture on your own, because some people just need actually need us to fight for them. Um, maybe eventually they'll want to become an advocate, but be, being a part of an advocacy community or following an advocacy community um, in social media, these are things that we, we do work on um, at within, which we'll talk more about that as Carrie Ann goes into some of the other groups and things that we work on, but we're really basically trying to combat oppression. Um, our, our program really involves a high frequency of individual therapy. So we all, I've always believed that this high frequency of therapy during acute treatment, where we're really trying to shift the paradigm and go down a different path is essential to effective treatment. We also believe the milieu itself is a very important part of our multidisciplinary team. So we believe in small milieus and really high quality group experiences, which is where not just the skills within the group or the foundations taught within the group are, are brought to the patient, but it's also the relationships within the milieus that are so important. We do have three milieus at within. We do have mature adult milieu, we have an adult and we have a 
uh, later an adolescent and adult milieu. So we do create three different milieus. There is sometimes some cross pollination and we do have specialty groups as well, such as an ARFID group or um, um, a parent group, or we have some other LGBTQ men or male identifying groups, that sort of thing, which is really nice for people because since we have a bigger milieu, we can create these little sub milieus. And we, I just can't emphasize how important we think those milieu, those milieu experiences really are to like fight up the oppression of diet culture. We have incredibly flexible scheduling to wrap around the person's life so that they can go on and live the parts of their life that are working well. We, we connect with folks in between our actual IOP and PHP sessions. This is why I actually call it, I actually call our program PHP plus IOP plus. The app doesn't replace the relationships, but we have a lot of functions within the app to give people support outside of traditional programming. We have a living room um, and we do meal delivery too, getting into not just the food insecurity like Carrie Ann mentioned, but also just the restriction that's a part of binge eating disorder. So the act of us, providing the food really is a message that you deserve. And we also want to make sure they're actually doing exposure therapy. It's not exposure therapy. It's not real treatment. If somebody's told to bring their own meal and they're bringing salads and things of that nature to supportive meals, like our folks need to eat the food that they need to eat when they're not with us, when they're with us. So they need to be able to eat pizza with us if they're going to eat pizza without us. And we want, we don't want any college student to be in their dorm on a Friday night and not able to eat pizza with their friends. We don't want any parents not eating birthday cake with their child. Um, we do um, a ton of work around um, the coaching and the education for the patient and for the families as well. And we use remote patient monitoring. So that's just a little bit of the foundation. Mm -hmm. All right. And so at Within Health, these are our goals for treatment for clients who have binge eating disorder. Um, the first one is to help them reconnect to hunger, fullness, and satiety to guide nutrition quality of life. So really focusing on the principles of intuitive eating and also not just focusing on hunger, fullness, but focusing on the satisfaction of food and being able to enjoy food and use food as celebration and things like that. We're also focusing on helping enhance emotion regulation and self-care practices. Um, and then adopting weight neutrality while increasing self-compassion and meaningfully empowering those impacted by binge eating disorder or by binge eating to combat anti-fat bias and diet culture. So we want to make sure like we're following a weight neutral approach and we're helping the patients that we're working with understand what weight neutrality is and the importance of it as well. Um, helping them gain peace with food, body, and movement and also working on exposure therapy to help recognize restriction mindset and patterns to challenge foods together. And kind of like Wendy said, like eating pizza in the milieu so that they can eat pizza outside of the milieu, things like that. And so besides the therapeutic interventions that we that I talked about earlier, again, like we're also including exposure therapy and that can be through food restriction. So that can also be like an exposure to not restrict to. Um, it also can be exposures to joyful movement, um, exposures to self-care, all different things. It's not just exposures to binge foods. We also provide psychoeducation and opportunities to practice mindfulness, mindful eating and intuitive eating. Um, so that can go, come through individual sessions or meal support groups and things like that. And then um, family and loved one therapy, coaching, and psychoeducation. So all three of those are equally as important. Sometimes a family member isn't so adept at the shift that you want them to take in therapy. They're very stuck in their own way of their, their own oppression or diet, the right. way culture. So sometimes we just have to get the right person on with that person and just say, kind of coach them like, Hey, if you continue to do behavior X, Y, or Z, your love, you, we're, we can't stop you. And we predict it will prolong the, the illness of your loved one or will be a stress or a trigger. A lot of times we have to tailor who that person is to send the message, but we don't just rely on therapy. We, we really count on the importance of the coaching and the education. And we're very selective about who does some of the coaching interventions. Um, it makes a very big difference. And sometimes mm -hmm. we're doing that. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. Mm -hmm. 
And so as for group therapy, we have two groups right now that we run. One is the Beyond Binging group. So this group is a process group that provides a safe place for clients to explore um, their relationship with food and bodies. It also helps decrease shame and secrecy around binge eating behaviors um, and helps enhance, develop, and support intentional self-care practices. So a funny story about that is when we came, first came up with our programming for binge, um, for binge eating disorder, we came up with the name Beyond Binging. Um, and Wendy, feel free to jump in. But Wendy Go wanted us story, to, please. Okay. <laughs> Wendy <laughs> wanted us to jump in. Wendy wanted us to like change the name to something that felt more inclusive of the experience of binge eating disorder. So something that also spoke to restriction and self-care practice and emotion regulation. Um, so we changed the name to Attuned. And the group members in this group really wanted us to keep beyond binging. And one of the reasons why was because they felt showing up to that space with the name beyond binging really helped decrease shame, really helped decrease the secrecy around binge eating. Binge eating. They knew that they could show up there and that's what they were going to talk about. And for a lot of them, it was the first time they were able to talk about binge eating in a group setting or even like at all outside of like a therapeutic session, one-on-one -on -one session. So, and we see it time and time again in that group, how validating it is for people to hear each other's stories um, and to support each other. So it's really great space, really safe. And even just goes to like within health, like we listen to our clients when they're telling us that how they feel about certain things and what's helpful and what's not helpful. I really felt like it was a testament to like progress in our society in a sense too, because I was really protective of the patients. And I thought by naming it attuned, it would be more holistic and like Carrie Ann would get more to like some of the core elements that drive binging. And I was thinking, oh, we just call it binging. It's just like targeting the behavior. It's not really validating the underlying thing. So we need to call it attuned. And I thought all the patients are going to be so happy about this name and isn't that great that Wendy mm -hmm. wanted it? And they literally like almost rioted. They were like, <laughs> they were like, oh no, we're calling it beyond binging. And I was like, right. and then Carrie Ann and others told me, and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we also have offer um, recovery at every size. And I put this in here, not because it's a group for clients, um, specifically that have binge eating disorder, but it is a group for clients where it's a safe place for people in larger bodies for them to process their experience, um, processing body image distress, their lived experience of being in a larger body in medical settings um, and within the family system, challenging the weight stigma that we've been talking about. So binge eating disorder has two thirds of the population are living in a larger body, but not everyone in this group as binge eating disorder. So it is important. That's an important distinction, but it also is a really great safe place to talk about um, what clients are experiencing in their bodies and also helping them learn more about body liberation and how to push back against fat phobia that they experience. And this group has been so popular that there's also an alumni offering of it because people have found it to be so therapeutic for them. So just briefly, because I know we're getting a little short on um, time, you do hear people talk a lot more these days about trauma-informed therapy. And I you know, think it's important in this talk to talk about trauma-informed briefly because many of our patients, most of our patients have you know, experienced trauma related to weight stigma, especially with, with regard to uh, shame around binging or living in a larger body. Um, and some of the ways that they've received uh, trauma from treatment is restrictive meal plans, which I have already mentioned, mandated movement, which there's even some programs that reinforce movement um, and push movement on people living in larger bodies, which we think that that can really do a tremendous amount of harm. We actually had a patient who was told by her doctor, you're, you're, you're fat every day, you should exercise every day. And I apologize for that, if that's triggering, but it, and this actually came from the doctor though. And so there's such an oppression around others infusing themselves and telling you what you should eat and how you should move your body. And that's really an invasion, you know, of the self to the self. 
um, and an override of the person's like core essence. So we think it's really important to understand restriction and mandated movement as a form of trauma. And also there's healthcare providers that really have a denial of the severity of the symptoms or the implication of the symptoms because the result of the symptom is a, a weight gain versus a weight loss. And we think that is actually also a form of trauma because it really is like gaslighting and it really is like a minimization of the person's true, true needs, um, which we think need to be validated and supported. And the other thing about, you know, so trauma really is about um, attuned care. If you could just go to the next one, there you go. Um, it's really about being attuned. It's really asking like, what happened to you? Not what, what the hell is wrong with you? Excuse my language, but what happened to you? It is about avoiding the avoidance. It's being, creating a safe space, being present. Um, and also some education about, you know, about what they deserve and what they what they do actually deserve and involves both our organization and clinical practices. We believe that trauma informed is not blaming the patient. Um, it's not saying just what is wrong with you. It's saying what happened with you, what happened to you. Um, so things like, oh, they haven't hit rock bottom or she's not ready or he's not ready or I'm not working harder than the patient. Those are some of the phrases that you hear um, typically in treatment centers that I absolutely go crazy if somebody says something like that, um, because the onus is actually on us as providers to understand the person and their history and to help them heal wherever they're at, starting with wherever they're at. And we absolutely have to work harder than the patient sometimes, we absolutely must. Um, some of our patients have not just their own trauma, but the trauma of provided, you know, trauma they've experienced in healthcare settings and doctor settings and the treatment settings. So we have a lot to do, a lot of cleanup to do sometimes. Um, and we do believe very much in using specific approaches such as those listed. Um, we don't, I don't want to keep going on and on about trauma because we're a little bit short on time, but the four R's have to do with realization about trauma recognizing the signs of symptoms, responding is very important, how we respond and then resisting re-traumatization. So we can just keep going from that. Um, just real quickly, um, I developed this kind of graphic many years ago um, because I think it really ties in with really all forms of eating disorder, certainly with binging, binge eating disorder, but it really ties into looking at how a person's interpersonal needs may not be met. And we really see this a lot in binging disorder. And binging is sort of a way to kind of placate against the, you know, the the oppression of diet culture or just the the way that a person has like been basically sometimes shaped in their in their or you know their environment to not take their needs seriously. And this lack of interpersonal needs being met actually is so correlates into self-shame because when our needs aren't met, we're usually not saying, oh, the environment's just mixed up or having their own problem. We, we say, oh, our needs are too much. That's what a little child does. A child doesn't think, oh, mommy's just got her own trauma, right? And that's why she's struggling right now. A child thinks I'm, I need too much. And that turns into self-shame. And then our culture drives that into body shame. And then body shame gets driven into restriction. And then the whole pathway just kind of takes off. And we also believe that addressing shame is really tied into increasing mindfulness because when a person is engulfed in shame, then there's this conflict and anxiety around eating and sort of decreased ownership of the self while eating. There's a great book by Janine Roth called, um, if you eat at the refrigerator, pull up the chair. Janine Roth was one of the first people that really helped me recover, but it's really about reducing the shame increases, um, the opportunity for mindfulness. So we really are focusing on addressing the shame and enhancing mind mindfulness because that's really correlated. So the more shame, the more, more mindlessness. And um, we also really like to teach our team about what like some categories of interpersonal needs are. This is Kaufman. I think it's underutilized um, to really be able to kind of ratchet down and think about some of the interpersonal needs that are clients do have. And like in addressing some of these interpersonal needs, we're actually able to help them heal and, and, and engage in better self-care practices overall. We all need to be loved and wanted. 
we all need to be touched and held. We all need some kind of identification of some a culture that we feel like we are a part of within our family, our community. We need to be able to differentiate. Um, sometimes in intergenerational trauma, there's a lot of guilt and shame around separating separation and investigation. We need to be able to nurture like kids that want to have a cat or a dog or things of that nature. We we don't just need nurturing. We need to be able to get deliver nurturing. We need my kids used to like to brush my hair and I was like, this is so great. Um, and they really enjoyed that. So they enjoyed nurturing their mommy. Um, and we need to all, we all need affirmation. So in our society where folks living in larger bodies are constantly invalidated, we have to be really affirming of our of our, our folks. And so also going along with everything that we're talking about as um, a program, we like to pride ourselves on being a health at every size providers. And so this, the health at every size was trademarked by the association for size diversity and health. So I'm going to briefly go through the new principles and framework, but I strongly recommend everyone like going to their website, learning more about it. If you're unaware, um, and just seeing all the resources that they have there. So that's asdah.org. And so the new principles, which were created this year are that healthcare is a human right for people of all sizes, including those at the highest end of the size spectrum. That care is fully provided only when free from anti-fat bias and offered with people of all sizes in mind. That well-being, care, and healing are resources that are both collective and deeply personal. And that health is a socio-political construct that reflects the values of society. So there's a lot of like misunderstanding of health at every size um, but at its principle it's trying to help dismantle anti-fat bias and oppression in the healthcare system so focusing on looking at each person that comes in as an individual and making sure that we're also trying to shift towards collective liberation in terms of like healthcare and everything so some of their framework um kind of as a guiding light for how you can practice this as a provider um, kind of goes in different characters, but I think some of the important ones to talk about are like patient bodily autonomy, in con informed consent and compassionate care. Um, we want to make sure that the people that we're working with know what they are signing up for and know what the resources are out there, know what their options are. Um, and also making sure that the new research moving forward is also following people based off of all different shapes and sizes, all different socioeconomic backgrounds and things like that, um, so that we're actually giving medical advice that is appropriate. And then at the end, like addressing your own anti-fat bias and addressing systemic anti-fat bias, so individually and collectively as a society. So learning more about um, the health at every size framework, learning more about your own anti-fat bias and diving a little bit deeper into that is super important and something that we really strive for at within. So how do we incorporate, Wendy, did you want to add something? Oh no, please go. Okay. Go ahead. So how do we incorporate this weight neutral approach and health at every size at within? So one of the important things that we do is we help educate, acknowledge, and address the trauma of weight stigma. So we've been talking about this throughout. Um, that weight stigma is a trauma that a lot of the clients that show up with binge eating disorder have experienced in their life, especially through medical providers. I mean, even just negligence of medical care due to weight stigma. So being prescribed weight loss as the first thing that a provider prescribes for someone when there's could be so much more going on. And also we know that weight loss doesn't equal health. So why are we still doing that? Also providing psychoeducation for our patients, for family members, and for healthcare providers. So we want to make sure that our clients are build up that knowledge so that they can advocate for themselves. And so that we can, add, and we also advocate for them as well. So we'll call healthcare providers and give them information and talk about what's, what we believe are the best treatment plans for our clients. Um, and there's also that like double-edged sword of advocacy because at, a, at its core, everyone deserves healthcare, right? Everyone deserves appropriate healthcare. And so people shouldn't have to advocate for that, but they do. And so we kind of validate that with our clients and let them know, like, we hear you that you shouldn't have to do this and let's help you learn how to. 
And I just want to say briefly that we we felt, feel that many of our patients do not actually realize that they've been mm -hmm. traumatized by right. the experience of weight stigma and they they may actually think they deserve it. So we really have to reiterate their, you know, advocacy of themselves. And we sometimes we need to do it for them because I mean, eating and being fed is most central to our basic human needs. Um, so we really are talking about a gigantic paradigm shift here and deprogramming them from almost like a cult, a cult around diet culture. And so an, another important thing to touch on is that our milieu is based on social reinforcement. Um, and so we also have group norms that prohibit fat phobic language. So in our group norms, fat is not, fat is a neutral descriptor. And so it's not to be used as a feeling. It's not to be used as a fear, especially in group spaces. Um, we also teach patients how to advocate for themselves around food based messages. So whether preparing them for when they go back to the real world or in the real world when they're in our programming. So we advocate for them to be able to say things in meals and to talk about things that are coming up that are triggering for them. The reason we have a lion here is that from many years ago, I asked Carrie Ann to put a lion on this and if she, she so ap adeptly did, because we really have to teach people to let out a roar in a sense, if people mm -hmm. like intrude into their space around self-care practices in general and what they need to eat and how much they need to move. So people do because of our society have to have like, you know, we just sort of have to, you know, channel that inner, inner lion or lioness um, to let out a roar and like be self-protective. And we will do that also for them. Mm -hmm. And we also have like group offerings around this. So like I mentioned earlier, recovery at every size. And we also have liberation lab, which is for any client who's interested in learning more about, um, weight neutrality and pushing back against weight stigma and fat phobia and um, diet culture. Just real quick, our, our nutrition approach really um, ad addresses um, depri the deprivation mindset and the shame-based mindset involves a tremendous amount of exposure therapy um, and really teaching that combo platter of mindfulness intuitiveness, which also can involve actually structured eating because there some can sometimes be executive functioning issues and so much shame that the person is not going to be able to um, just intuitively eat on their own. So we really find where that person's at and we do create structure and we really pay attention and insist on um, people eating. Um, you cannot be a mindful eater if you're super shame based. You cannot be a mindful eater if you're like focused on weight loss. So we have to really focus on those underlying dynamics um, in order to actually help the person open up the space to mindfulness. And then with movement, we really believe that our patients very often, if they've been living in larger bodies, really have not received that time and space in their life where they're permitted to not move or they're actually asked to rest. So many of our patients have had that oppression of, you know, push, push, push. And, and, and so it's really magical when we say, Hey, let's take some time to rest and like decoupling eating with movement. Sometimes people feel like if I eat, I must move my body. Some people are very just, just cut off from their bodies and sort of everything in between. Um, and we really believe that by giving some space to the person's soul to sort of figure it out themselves, that the essence of who they are does resurface and becomes empowered. And we really want to encourage their soul to heal versus the societal pressure, pressure to, you know, move, move in response to eating that everybody deserves to eat and be nurtured regardless. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go through some statistics really quickly. Um, we found for the EDEQ, which is the overall degree of disordered eating attitudes and behaviors for our clients with binge eating disorder, we've seen a 50% decrease in eating disorder symptoms. We, for the EDQOL, which is the degree of eating disorder related quality of life concerns, we've seen a 57% decrease in impact on quality of life. Um, we've seen a 45% decrease in depression symptoms from the PHQ-9. And we've seen a 21% decrease in anxiety symptoms um, based off the SDAIS. We think that, you know, just quickly, there's some distinctive advantages to remote care. Um, I call it remote, not virtual, because these are real relationships with between real human beings. Um, but really engaging from treatment at home where we have the actual stressors and triggers exist and then having the team there with you really is a beautiful 
thing that we find. It can be harder, but when we're able to address those folks' individual needs within their real-time environment, it can be really, really powerful. Um, and the, um, the experience of being able to just access care. So many of our folks are living in remote areas or they have obligations where they, you know, one of our first patients was a BED patient who couldn't leave her home because she was a massage therapist. And if she didn't do her work, she didn't pay her, her rent. So being able to just work with people around their real life issues. And we certainly find being able to help people navigate after higher levels of care is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Actually, Carrie Ann's working with somebody who just had a six month stay at a higher level of care. And I would, mm -hmm. can't even imagine what her life would have been like if she would have just gone right. home to her rural environment. And then, you know, some of the, some of the um, limitations really just have to do with patient preference, um, you know, safety concerns. Do they have access to the internet? Um, and some people do better when they just, they do need a space and time away from their home. So there's definitely limitations, but we've definitely learned through our outcome measurement program that this is a very effective treatment when, when it's done well. We don't think all remote treatment is the same. Um, and our program is, I think, a little bit beyond just a PHP and IOP. And we think that we knew when we de developed this program, we we're going to work with the security that we we're going to have to do a lot in order for it to work. And that's why we do work outside of just program hours and, and our app so, sort of facilitates those connections. We definitely see a big difference as far as access. So we're now in 36 states and counting. And we wanted to share one of a, a quote that we really like so much that it helps guide our principles, which is that rigidity in the face of complexity is toxic. Little shameless self-promotion of my book that I wrote a long time ago that I never <laughs> hardly ever tell people about but one of my friends was like why don't you tell people more about your book so this is my book called questions and answers on binge eating disorder a guide for clinicians thank you all very much we actually got through this with only one minute overage so <laughs> thank you for that. and I know we have a lot of questions here and I think we're going to make sure we get um, answers to everybody mm -hmm. Yes, so thank you both Carrie Ann and Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt. That was such an insightful presentation. And I also wanna thank you all for sharing in this space with us today, for being with us to celebrate our webinar series. Both Jamie and I wanna make sure that all of your questions are honored. I did put both of our emails again in the chat. I wanna add it again there. If you have any questions that we weren't able to get through today, I did record some as well, but just if you have any additional questions, feel free to email both of us and we will get those filtered on. To our presenters, we wanna make sure that your questions are answered and that you're feeling honored in this space. Again, just wanna send a big thank you to Carrie Ann and Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt for today. Also want to send a reminder for our presentation that's coming up this July. The topic is considerations for psychological testing in a virtual setting. And that will be again on July 26th at 11 a.m. EST and will be presented by our, one of our own clinical psychologists, Ronnie Lee. I also want to plug as well to keep up for our summit that is coming up October 11th or October 8th through the 11th. Watch out for our social media sites for all of that information to come. And again, registration will be available on our social media platforms for that July presentation. So keep up with that. And other than that, thank you all again for sharing in the space. Feel free to email both of us with any questions that arise. And again, thank you, Carrie Ann and Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt. Thank you all so very much. And please be on the lookout for our outcome report that, that we'll be um, distributing in the next probably week to two weeks, like Jamie mentioned. So we're really excited to share um, that outcome from our first uh, two years of work, almost three years of work. Thank you all very much. Thank you guys. And also just another reminder, the recording for today's presentation should be available within a few hours. I just like to be safe and say maybe tomorrow for sure, but the recording will be accessible to you in your CEGO dashboard, along with information on how to obtain your certificate. If you are looking for the CME, please email me directly and I will send those instructions out separately. And the information in the chat, the feedback is phenomenal. So great job, Carrie Ann and Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt. Thanks, you guys. It's Thank nice you. spending time together. Take good care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.